So what I want to talk to you about is mashing. Um, and what we do, just a second, is talk a good basic definition to begin with, and then practical overview of the general things that are going on in a mash and the processes. And then I want to talk about starches. The main job of the mash for the brewer is to convert those starches into sugar. And we'll talk about that and then how the enzymes work. And then some practical factors in the brew house to create nutritious work. So what are the optimal um, temperatures, pHs and conditions to, to make that happen? And then a little bit at the end to talk about work composition. So, mashing is the term given to the start of the brewing process, where grains that are crushed are mixed with water to form a porridge-like mixture called the mash. It is in the mash that the malt and other cereal starches are transformed into sugars and proteins and other materials are made soluble, creating the sweet fermentable liquid called wort. So this is the stuff that's in the kettle, coming up to the boil before you put the hops in, which is why we call it sweet wort. And I don't know if you've ever tasted the first runnings of a mash tun, but it really does taste nice. It's fabulous. So the mill malt forms the grain mixture called a grist. And this is a mixture of different sized particles. And we mix that grist carefully with controlled amounts of warm or hot water at specific temperatures to form the mash. There's three basic types of mashing process, as Colin mentioned. We've got infusion mashing, decoction mashing, and temperature controlled infusion mashing. The different mashing processes that are used in different parts of the world, depending on local tradition, the quality of the malt available, the equipment used, and the beer style brewed. In this presentation, as Colin mentioned again, we'll concentrate on infusion mashing, which, use, which uses well modified malt, uh, which you can get mainly in the UK in some other countries too but it does need to be low nitrogen well modified to suit that particular system okay some practical overview then mashing is essentially a continuation of the malting process when we're germinating them all we're immobilizing enzymes those enzymes are breaking down storage proteins they're breaking down small starch granules to create a plant essentially and then once that gets to a certain stage and it's digested all the small starch granules, it will basically, then we need to stop that process by gentle kilning to preserve the enzymes. Because then when we start mashing, we reactivate those enzymes because we wet the grain and they start to work on the large starch granules, which gives you the sugar and the extract that you need to make beer. So we hydrate the crushed malt. You can buy it crushed from crisp, or you can buy it, uh, you can buy it whole and then mill it yourself. And you mix it with hot water to form a mash at a temperature that encourages these starch degrading enzymes to work. One important factor, particularly in the colder months, is that you should preheat the mash tun. Um, otherwise, you're going to get a reduction in temperature on your mash. Remember to discard this before you mash in because it won't be at the right temperature for mashing. Once you've dropped that out, add some foundation liquor. Uh, this will cover the plates and it will protect the mash and avoid cloudy works. Just remember to deduct that volume from the total mash liquor that you need uh, because the mash, the liquor to grist ratio is quite important in terms of how the beer finishes. One important note, and I've seen this happen in a few breweries, is mashes shouldn't be excessively mixed. Um, obviously, you want to have a well hydrated mash. You don't want any clumps of uh, non hydrated grain there, so try and remove those. But I've seen in some breweries where some people really paddle it around. And what can happen there is it's going to release fine particles and you're going to get beta glucans. These can be sheared and extracted into the work, and that will make the work sticky and viscous and difficult to run off. You can use torrified cereals directly in the mash, uh, and these can have flavor, and if you've got a particularly high nitrogen barley, it will dilute the nitrogen out and avoid any haze issues later in shelf life or DD pack. Generally, a mash can last from anything from 45 minutes to 90 minutes, and that will depend on the type of mash that you're doing, the type of material you've got in the grist, 
And it's important that full conversion happens. And that means that all the starch is converted to sugar. And you can do that by, you, by doing an iodine test on the grains. And we'll talk about that later on. So what's happening in the mash? The soluble sugars and proteins that we've created in the malting process are leached from the grist particles. The enzymes begin to kick in and they will start degrading some of the insoluble starches that are in the grist. There'll be a drop in pH, and that's due to the presence and interaction of calcium ions and phosphates. There'll be some other chemical interactions which are quite complex uh, for other constituents of the work, which we'll probably cover at a later date. At the end of the mashing process, when we start to sparge, then we're going to try and denature and inactivate the enzymes because we don't want them to carry on during the runoff of the wort because that might cause over attenuation and excess alcohol or more than you want. So let's have a look at the starches. Um, the first one to think about is amylose. So that's a picture of amylose. It constitutes about 20 to 30 percent of the starch in the grain. And it's a straight chain polymer of glucose units. And they're linked at the one four positions. So if we look here, this is position one, and then this is position four. So one, two, three, four. So it's a one four linkage. The left hand terminus is reducing, and the right hand terminus is non reducing. And that's important when we start thinking about how the enzymes begin to work. The bulk of the starch is made up of a myelopectin, which as you can see from that diagram is quite a bit more complex. It constitutes 70 to 80% of the starch. It's quite a complex branched structure. And what they've discovered is that it branches on average around about every 27 glucose units. So this is a glucose unit. It links at the alpha 1 6 positions at the branches. So you can see here this is position 6 and this is position 1. They only have one reducing terminus, but they have a non reducing termini, termini at, each, at the end of each of the branches. So here, which is really important when the enzymes start to work. So let's think about these enzymes alpha amylase is an endoenzyme and it breaks any of the alpha 1 4 linkages in amylose and amylopectin. So it's working inside, it's not working from the ends, it's working, it can break up those molecules from the inside, it doesn't have to work on the ends. So what it essentially does, it opens up the starch molecules and at that point you'll see a dramatic reduction in viscosity. Once we've reached gelatinization temperature, um, which is 58 to 62 degrees uh, for barley and for barley malt, then the starch structure uncoils, so it becomes more available for enzyme to access the, uh, the linkages, and alpha amylase will then chomp away inside and start breaking all these branches up and reducing the polymer size. So what we say is that alpha amylase liquefies starch. The optimum temperature range is 70 to 75 degrees C and a pH of 5.3 to 5.8. We've then got beta amylase. So this is an exoenzyme. It works from the ends and it breaks the chain at every second glucose at the non-reducing terminus. This is why it's important that we get the branches at the ends of the uh, amylopectin uh, and then that makes these more available and, and the beta amylase can start creating these simpler sugars. So it will fully reduce amylose, but it'll only reduce 10 to 15% of amylopectin unless it's working with the alpha amylase, which is breaking things up and making more of these non-reducing termini. What we say with the beta amylase is that it saccharifies starch and produces maltose, which is the main sugar in order to the yeast likes to ferment. Its optimum temperature is 63 to 65 degrees, so quite a bit lower, at a pH of 5.4 to 
So I'll put this little diagram in here. So this is time, moving from left to right. And we've got the starches in the grain to begin with when you first mash in. You get to the gelatinization temperature and this opens up, so it unfolds. Then what happens is you start getting these, the, the alpha families will start to break down these and, and create these ends. And then the beta amylase starts to come in and create the simpler sugars that we can see here. When we put iodine onto the grains, if there's starch present, it will be this color. It will be black blue. And then as we break down the starches and we get more simple sugars, it goes through brown into a kind of yellow color. And that's when you know that you've got full conversion and you're not going to take any starch forward, which could cause some issues. So here's a nice graph of the different activities and temperatures. So along the top here, we've got temperature in degrees C. On the bottom, we've got temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And up on the left-hand side here, you've got the activity of the enzymes. So beta amylase, we've got quite a wide distribution of temperature. And then alpha amylase comes in later, and that peaks at 70 degrees. And you can see there's this kind of crossover here at 67 when there's lots and lots of activity. As we progress up the temperature scale on mashing, fermentability drops and dextrins increase. So dextrins are the molecules that yeast can't really metabolize all that well. And we'll talk about that later. So what we, see, what we can see here in this purple section is that there's a, an opportunity, a brewer's window, if you like, of the optimum temperature to get the best extract, and the most fermentable work. Let's think about temperature now in a bit more detail. So if we were to mash in at 63 degrees, we'd have lots of beta amylase activity, low extract efficiency, but high work fermentability. At 65, kind of middle of the road, we've got beta amylase starting to drop away. Alpha amylase is beginning to kick in and start to work. We get medium extract efficiency and very, fairly average work fermentability. At 68 degrees, beta amylase is almost inactive. Uh, alpha amylase is, is very busy and very active. There'll be good extract efficiency with this type of mashing temperature, um, but fermentability will be a little bit lower. Once we've done that mash stand, the saccharification stand for 45 to 90 minutes, as I mentioned, we'll then start to run off the mash tun and extract the wort, and then wash out those lovely worty sugars and sweet sugars with hot liquor. And that liquor, that hot water, should be at 78 degrees or more, um, because what happens is that will actually inactivate the alpha amylase and stop it from breaking down the sugars and creating a work that's too fermentable. And that's pretty important in terms of control of your attenuation limit. Mash thickness plays a part. So thinner mashes can cause enzyme denaturation, uh, particularly in some barleys with beta amylase and uh, a couple of other enzymes that have relatively low activity, but they are activated in thinner mashes and those are carboxypeptidase and protease. Thicker mashes tend to insulate and protect enzymes, so they will survive better and have more activity. So a relatively watery mash with a high liquor to grist ratio at 62 to 64 degrees will create a more fermentable wort, so it will finish at a lower gravity and produce a lighter bodied beer. A thicker mash, at 67 to 69 degrees, we create a less fermentable work, so that will finish higher in final gravity and produce fuller bodied beers. So, for those of you in the UK who might be familiar with it, uh, the Sharps Doom Bar was always mashed at 68 degrees, and that beer, if, if you've tasted it, is quite full bodied for a 4% alcohol beer. What you need to do when you're thinking about the beer style you want to make is getting the appropriate mash thickness and temperature for that style of beer because that then will give you the right finish and the right mouthfeel once the beer goes into package.
Another important factor is pH. So the optimum for infusion masses, as we saw from the enzymes there, is 5.2 to 5.5. You need to keep in mind that if you're going to measure that, it needs to be measured at 20 degrees C, because otherwise there will be a, a skew because of the temperature. So always remember to do that. So an optimal marsh will uh, have more rapid amylolytic start, starch degradation, so the enzymes are going to be working at their optimum. There'll be enhanced carboxypeptidase activity. Proteins will be solid, more soluble, and they'll coagulate more readily uh, once we get through to the, the work kettle. And there'll be minimum tannin extraction or polyphenol extraction. If the pH is high, then maybe you're going to experience this if you've got um, hard water in, in, in your area where you're making your beer. Then you're going to get poor saccharification, so you're not going to get those nice, simple fermentable sugars. Wort separation will take longer, so a longer runoff. Worts will tend to be darkened. They'll be more susceptible to biological attack um, from beer spoiling organisms. There'll be relatively poor protein precipitation. And because of the extraction of tannins, the beer could become astringent and harsh. So how do we reduce the mash pH? Using dark malts tends to reduce mash pH, so that might be part of the recipe. And if that's the case, great. If you don't want a particularly dark beer, then what you can do is you can acidify the mash with inorganic acids. So you can use sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, or my preference is phosphoric acid because it's not adding any particular minerals that will affect flavor. Another thing that a lot of people do, particularly in hard water areas, is acidify the strike liquor. So this is the liquid in the hot liquor tank, and you can use a proprietary product from a company called Murphy & Son, uh, AMS, that is a mixture of sulfuric and hydrochloric acids to bring down the pH and reduce alkalinity, or you can use lactic acid which needs to be food grade. Another way to do uh, the reduction in pH is to use uh, an appropriate level of calcium salts. So adding calcium chloride or calcium sulfate will actually reduce the pH by interaction with phosphates. So let's have a little look now at work composition. So the carbohydrate portion is 90 to 92% of the total. 50% of that will be maltose. 13% around about there for the water triose, which is three glucose units long. And then there'll be some simple, really simple sugars there, the one glucose units, and that should be about 10%. You need to be quite careful not to create too much glucose uh, because some yeasts don't like it and uh, it gets them, it, it stresses them, uh, and they are called glucose repressant. The remainder are dextrins. So these are what's left of those branched structures that we looked at in the amylopectins. And the wort enzymes won't break them all the way down. You need to use a, an exogenous enzyme to do that, to make it completely fermentable. Interestingly, some yeasts, the saison yeasts and some strains of retinomyces, uh, which are a, a wild yeast, do have the ability to produce alpha and beta amylase themselves and they can start to digest the dextrins once they've finished digesting the simple sugars that we created in the mash. And they don't do that immediately. So what can happen is it looks like the fermentation is completed, and then 12 to 24 hours later, after the yeasts have put these enzymes out into the, into the wort, they can start to ferment again. And like that's caught a few people out. Because when it starts to ferment again, if you put that in package, then it will create CO2 and it will cause popping cans and cause exploding bottles. So it's something to be very, very aware of is that. And just make sure that it has completely finished. Some people now, quite a lot in fact, are adding lactose. Uh, lactose is a milk sugar and that's added in the kettle. And it's fair to give body and it can uh, definitely leave like a residual milky sweetness, which suits for some beer styles. And it leaves it there because yeast, beer yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, cannot uh, metabolize lactose. Quick look at nitrogen. So, three to six percent of the total. Uh, polypeptides are the longer chain sequences of amino acids. Some of those are hydrophobic, 
means they don't like water. So they will come out of the beer and they will sit on the top and create the foam. There are some acidic ones too, and these are haze sensitive. They will complex with polyphenols during shelf life of a beer and create hazes. Peptides are two to 10 amino acid units long. Uh, some of those can be metabolized by yeast, some of the smaller ones, and the other ones, the slightly bigger ones, uh, will contribute to body and mouthfeel. By far for me, the most important one is free amino nitrogen. So these are the amino acids that will give the yeast its boost at the beginning of fermentation in the lag phase and get reproduction kicked in and it will create the biomass that's needed to complete the fermentation. And as a rule of thumb, a minimum of around 140 ppm in a, in a 1040 work would ensure a healthy yeast reproduction and ensure the fermentation completes on time and to where you want it to go to. Polyphenols can be present in worts, particularly if you've got high pH, like we mentioned. So polyphenols are astringent compounds. 80% of them come from the uh, proanthocyanogens in the husk of the malting grains and the underlying structures of the malt grain. Elevated pH and sparge temperatures can increase polyphenol levels. So if you sparge above 80 degrees C, then you can get more leaching of these quite astringent, harsh compounds. The oxidizable polyphenols can come through in the beer. And if they're not removed with stabilizers, um, then they will complex with the polypeptides that we mentioned on the last slide and form hazes. And that can happen maybe two to three weeks or even two to three months into shelf life. You've got a filtered beer and uh, that's in package. Interestingly, now a clear choice mold doesn't have any proanthocyanogens in the husk. That, that portion was bred out of that particular variety of barley. And so the sweet wort that's made from clear choice doesn't have any polyphenols in it. And that can be good for a couple of reasons. Obviously, stability, as we've just talked about, but also it will give a nice, sweet kind of honey sweet wort which tends to suit itself well to like New England IPAs and that style of beer because it's not fighting with any multi backbone it's going to let the hop shine through and quite a few of our customers use it for that purpose. So the final slide um, we'll talk about minerals so we talked about calcium earlier it does actually stabilize alpha amylase it helps precipitate phosphate and reduces pH. Um, that's important in terms of getting the correct pH in the mash tub. It will precipitate polypeptides, and that means it's going to reduce that haze risk, that, that combination, that complexing. And it also takes out oxalates, which can come from the grain. And oxalates form tiny little crystals, microscopic crystals, which can get all the way through into finished beer, even filtered beer, and that can cause the beer to gush because they form bubble nucleotides that the CO2 attaches to, and it just basically jumps out of the bottle all they can. Chlorides, if you've been adding calcium chloride, chlorides will increase um, the perception of body and fullness and sweetness up to a point too. So you tend to put quite a heavy chloride load into New England IPAs to get that nice full body, that sweetness and that juiciness. And sulfates, which would be calcium sulfate, would accentuate bitterness and quite dry on the palate. So this would be a classic kind of pale ale. Um, and that's how you get that finish and flavor on the palate by using sulfates. And also traces of various minerals, zinc, sodium, phosphates, manganese, magnesium, potassium, and copper. And all these come basically from the malt or from the water and they're important cofactors in yeast metabolism. So they do need to be there, uh, particularly copper. In actual so that's it. Quick run through mashing. Um, 